Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwood. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Global bond yields jump after more hawkish commentary from Fed officials. Investors now waiting on euro area inflation due in one hour from now. Also on the program, we discuss a macro outlook in our exclusive interview with Lorenzo Benismaghi, the chairman of Société Générale. Plus, later this hour in Bloomberg UK, we'll also have more of our interview with the chief executive of the LSC Group. It plans to buy back 750 million pounds worth of shares from a consortium, including Blackstone. Now, first thing is first, so let's check on the markets. We're seeing a little bit of pressure across the board after that hawkish commentary from Fed officials. Now, this is also on the back of rising assumptions that actually demand in China will grow significantly, fueling further inflation because of the reopening. So stock markets worldwide extending some of the losses today. That was really started yesterday. I'm looking at the U.S. 10-year Treasury bonds topping 4% for the first time since November. Again, a sign that the Fed's warning of high for longer interest rates finally sinking in. S&P futures down five tenths of eight percent, and then the German two-year yield at three two one eight. There was also a fantastic interview that. Christine Lagarde, president of the ECB, uh, just gave to a Spanish television where she talks about the need, first of all, reiterating that we're going to get a 50 basis point hike in March, but also the need possibly to raise rates further. This is a picture across the board. Look, for the moment, the FTSE is unchanged, but we are seeing pressure on the DAX and the FTSE maybe around four tenths of a percent lower. So let's get back to our Bloomberg, of course, main story, and that is inflation, inflation across uh, the world, the focus on how much. Um, some of these higher interest rates may go up in the U.S. and the Eurozone. We look at the swap markets as well. Let's also get to the Bloomberg First World News. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. The Greek Prime Minister says human error probably caused the country's worst rail crash in decades. The government is investigating the head-on collision between a passenger train and a freight service, which killed at least 43 people and left dozens more injured. The Greek transport minister has resigned while a station master has been arrested. Now, the UK is to make the case for greater cooperation with the European Union on financial services. On a visit to Berlin, Trade Minister Andrew Griffith will meet German banking chiefs and executives to discuss a framework for the two sides to work together. Further post-Brexit cooperation on financial services had been on hold due to the Northern Ireland trade dispute. Bridgewater Associates is embarking on a major overhaul five months after founder Ray Dalio stepped down. The world's largest head fund firm is capping the size of its flagship fund, ploughing more money into artificial intelligence and machine learning and expanding in Asia. The company's CEO says Bridgewater must, quote, evolve or die. SpaceX has launched a four-person crew to the International Space Station, part of the company's ongoing contract with NASA. The astronauts are riding inside the Crew Dragon spacecraft lifted off on top of a Falcon 9 rocket just after midnight local time from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens, and this is Bloomberg Francine. Thank you so much, Leanne. Now, ECB President Christine Lagarde says rate hikes may need to continue beyond a planned half-point move in two weeks' time. Now, it comes as Fed officials open the door to higher rates to curb high U.S. inflation. That's showing a few signs of abating. Now, a bit of a curiosity, I think there's also Christine Lagarde still live on Spanish TV where they're analyzing her signature on some of the euro notes. Now, for more on all of this, we will not analyze her signature right now. Bailey Wakefield, multi-asset portfolio manager at Aviva, Investor Global Services. Thank you for joining us. Bailey, when you look at the inflation trajectory for the for the Eurozone and, and the European Central Bank, how tricky is it going to be for them to raise rates significantly without killing off the economy? Well, it was expected that inflation would fall in Europe in February, but considering that we've seen three regional ups, uh, upside surprises or numbers holding steady, it could be that we have another upside surprise in store. Uh, regionally, we've seen surprises more from the price of food and energy cost pressures, uh, 
but we're yet to see signs of easing from price pressures. That's definitely something that they're going to have to keep a close eye on. And investors are going to look closely at the data points that we're seeing coming out today in the ECB minutes for clues as to how the pace of tightening might progress beyond the 50 bips that's priced in for March. But given those surprises and potentially another surprise today, further significant steps might be necessary. And it's a, it's a good reminder that the inflation path down can be quite choppy. So what does it mean for, if, if you look at some of the individual stocks or certainly industries, there's been so many job layoffs. Does it reflect the deteriorating conditions in Europe or is it just cost cutting to make sure that they can give back to shareholder returns? I think it, it's a bit of both. I mean, you're going to have some cost cutting measures. I think investors were very much aware that cost-cutting measures were going to have to be in the picture here. And with some of the results, we are seeing some volatility in terms of some of the returns that were given back to shareholders as well. So, for example, in the, the basic resources sector, we have seen some differences in, in dividends, which should have been somewhat expected given that they're targeted towards the payout policies that, that, that the companies are aligned to. But still, because of the, the change in price of commodities, which of course feed into the to, to inflation, we are seeing different payouts there. So that's something that investors are keeping a close eye on. Um, Bailey, every week we have an MLive question that we ask all of our you know, markets guests. Do you expect, and this is the one for this week, do you expect actively managed or passively mutual funds to outperform this year? Uh, I definitely side on active. I think these environments are perfect for active funds to take advantage of some of the underlying themes that we're seeing in, in markets at the moment. We are definitely seeing some choppiness in markets, depending on what the uh, the, the, the data points we're seeing released at every, ever, uh, any given kind of point in time or any given day. Mm -hmm. But being able to take active positions means that you can take advantage of those underlying themes in, uh, that, that, uh, that are cropping up in markets at the moment. All right, Bailey, thanks so much. Bailey Wakefield, multi-asset portfolio manager at Aviva Investors Global Services. Now, coming up, Societe General Chair Lorenzo Benismaghi on the outlook for the European economy on the back of hotter-than-expected inflation readings. That interview is up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Societe Generale says the markets are willing to price in more ECB rate hikes if data disappoints next month. That follows an unexpected acceleration in German inflation, further complicating the central bank's task after overshoots this week in other parts of the continent. Well, we're now very pleased to be joined exclusively by the Societe Generale chair, Lorenzo Binismaghi, one of, I guess, the few bankers in charge of a banking giant who also has first-hand monetary policy experience. So thank you, uh, Mr. Bini Smaghi, for joining us on Bloomberg. When you look at the problem that the Fed has, the Bank of England and the ECB, with we're targeting inflation, do they have to really crush economies to make sure that they hit their targets? Well, they are not crushing the economy because the problem arises from the fact that the economy is quite resilient. It, we haven't seen a, a recession uh, in spite of forecasts of recessions. Right. So the economy is stronger than expected, which means that inflation is higher than expected. And probably it means that interest rates have to be higher for longer. And there's no free lunch. I mean, in order to bring inflation down, history, there's no historical experience of inflation coming down without some, some cost to be paid. You have to be careful to calibrate well your, your instruments. But in the end, you can't give up. Uh, uh, right now. Uh, but, but, but why have we not seen an uglier economy right now? So is there a lag time of the monetary policy that was put in place in 2022? Or has the model and structure of our economies fundamentally changed? Well, first, certainly monetary policy operates with lags. Uh, one and a half to two years. So we have to see the impact. And probably the models that central banks use know that. So, so they have this. But our economies have been more resilient. If I think about Europe, with the, the increase in uh, interest rates, uh, the increase in oil, energy prices, uh, companies, households have used uh, their, their uh, savings. So we have been more resilient. How long will it last? That's, uh, yeah. that's to see. I think the key issue uh, going forward is the combination of the various policies. 
monetary policy is going to be tighter. No. Fiscal policy probably is going to be tighter because we have to come down from the deficits. And the other issue that nobody really talks is uh, prudential, super supervisory policy on banks. And this is also getting tighter because supervisors are getting concerned about uh, banks lending too much and so forth. So the combination of all this may lead to a policy mix which is very restrictive. Yeah. And so we may reach 2% maybe earlier than expected, but the impact on the economy may be quite negative. So what kind of an economy? So you think we could reach 2% inflation target earlier, but this wouldn't be, would it be as close as 2024 in Europe? And, and what, a full recession for most countries? Or how do you see that panning out? Well, that's difficult, but I think it's uh, difficult to forecast. But I think it's going to be difficult to get to 2% within 18 to 24 months uh, without a, a major slowdown in the economy. And that's, that's part of the adjustment process. On the other hand, if we give up, and let's remember, I mean, if you go back to history, Paul Volcker, which was a big inflation killer, he, he got it wrong the first time. He, he, he started to cut rates too soon. Then he had to increase it uh, again, increase rates again to up to 20 percent, the Fed fund rate in, in 1980. And this really crushed the economy. So, uh, we can't miss uh, uh, if we don't do it wrong. If you if we give up too early, then the price would be much higher. When do you see peak rates actually in Europe? And again, I, I know it's a difficult question, <laughs> which, uh, but it, does it have to be in September? So do you have to just hike aggressively, and then wait and see? Is that the, the better option, the better way to um, look at it? My impression is once the economy slows down, it's going to be very difficult for central banks to continue increase rates. Uh, they have to say that they will do it. They have to be to talk very toughly, uh, to to be hawkish. But once you see strong signs of recession with unemployment going up, it's going to be more difficult. So I think they, this is why they are trying to to catch up rapidly. Uh, so in the spring, uh, until June, I think they will continue to raise rates. But after that, I think they will they will rather pause. What are your clients telling you? So when you look at the first couple of months of this year, are they worried about inflationary pressures? You know, how's lending going? Well, actually. Uh, there are no signs of major problems. I mean, our clients in general, and it's not a good, uh, it's not a good uh, 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 sample because we tend to have the good clients of, you know, it's the rest of the economy, which maybe is less supported by the financial system who gets into trouble uh, that have problems. But our clients actually are doing relatively well. Uh, they have restructured. Uh, they are more cautious, of course, but uh, they are not uh, concerned about the future. The problem is the rest of the economy, which has to, to still do the restructuring. And, and once the consumption will start to decline, because consumers will have to adapt to higher energy prices and, yeah. and will not have the, uh, the savings accumulated from the past, at that point, we will see a, a sharper slowdown. But does that, is that accompanied also with the employment, the, you know, a lot of unemployment, which we haven't seen for the yes, moment? We have exactly, a very yeah, tight labor yeah. market. That's a surprise. I mean, the economy is doing have been doing relatively well, been quite resilient, especially in Europe. We didn't expect that. On the other hand, uh, this shows that uh, bringing down inflation is going to be easy. Uh, and we haven't had inflation for 15 years, so nobody really knows uh, how, how far you need to, uh, to put pressure uh, uh, on the economy to bring inflation down. Uh, rising interest rates is good for banks. You should be making a lot of money on the back of it. Do you feel like Société Générale can really reap the full rewards or is it held back by, I guess, French rules? Well, I mean, the French market is not easy, uh, at, the, at least in the, in the first year, at the beginning of the rate increase, uh, given that we have fixed rates on the, on the lending side, we take the we have the opportunity, of course, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, passing on to the clients uh, uh, much more slowly than in other uh, parts of the world, uh, in, in countries like Spain or, or, or Northern Europe. Uh, but uh, so we, take to, we keep the risk, we keep the interest rate risk, which you know, banks are expected to manage it better than, than yeah. clients. So in fact, these, these, uh, these credits are uh, sounder, have a lower credit risk. So we have, uh, so, so uh, we, we manage ourselves the interest rate risk, but it is sounder from the solidity of the, uh, from the point of view of the solidity of the economy. Which is a good thing? Or, is it, or yes, does it, it mean it's a good you thing could, because you have to, to, you have to look at the long term. Yeah. Uh, in the short term, they take the benefit, but in the yeah. long term, we have less risks yeah. and we can absorb it. And then when rates will come down, we will continue to have. Uh, 
uh, benefits for a longer period of, of time. All right, so Mr. Binismagi, Lorenzo Binismagi, Sok, Jen, Chairman, stays with us. So we'll talk a lot more about the banking world and, of course, possibly banking consolidation. I feel like I ask Lorenzo every time he comes on whether there'll be cross-border M&A. We'll have plenty more with Lorenzo Binismagi shortly. This is Bloomberg. This month, Bloomberg brings you the latest from China's 14th Annual National People's Congress, including China's COVID recovery, economic outlook, and geopolitical tensions. Coverage begins next week on Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Société Générale Chair Lorenzo Benismagi is still with us. Uh, Lorenzo, thank you so much for sticking around. We talked about inflation, the right path forward. Talk to me a bit about Société Générale. So you have an incoming chief executive. Are you expecting the strategy to change, or what will this bank become in the next three to four years? Well, uh, we'll, we'll wait the new CEO, and we'll discuss uh, with him. Clearly, there are some... Uh, um, some issues which are clear. We have a uh, restructuring of the French retail, um, a merger between the two, which is going to be completed. Uh, the restructuring of the investment bank has been uh, processing. We have a lot of new avenues, the merger between uh, Lease Plan and uh, ALD, the development of the, onla the online bank, uh, Boursorama. So many, many issues on the plate for the new CEO. And, uh, you know, we look forward to develop with him uh, the new a new process going forward. Do, do you think your bank will feel a, a lot of pressure to give more back to shareholders through either share buybacks or dividends? Well, I mean, that's a very interesting issue. I think there's a lot of pressure doing that. I think banks uh, may have different strategies around the world. Yeah. Uh, some banks may think that, you know, in the end, the market uh, is mainly local. It's what it is. It doesn't grow much. So what should I do with the, uh, with the additional capital? I give it back to shareholders. We as a bank, we think we have many businesses where we can compete with the American banks, with the other European banks. We can grow. So we want to use the capital uh, more efficiently uh, possible in order to, to get more businesses and to make the bank more profitable. So it's a different strategy from other banks, but uh, we need to do the buybacks uh, as in line with the, the dividend policy, but we need also to grow. I think that's what the European economy needs. It needs European banks that can support uh, European companies to, to compete in the, in, in, the, in the global economy and that's our, uh, that's our role, I think, yeah. to support or, this. Orga organically <laughs> or through cross-border acquisitions? Right now it's organic because the banking system is in the process of restructuring, improving profitability, then we will see. I think that depends on the regulators also to make it easier mm -hmm. for banks to, uh, uh, to, to make mergers. Uh, maybe the market will put pressure on that, but right now I think... Yeah. We have to, to look at, uh, at uh, our, own, uh, our own restructuring yeah. and improving our profitability. Um, Lawrence, every time I speak to a banking executive, tattooed to my brain is ask about bonuses and ask about job cuts. I mean, this is one of the, the things that people want to know and want to read about. How is the bonus pool looking at? So do you feel like you need to increase people's pay to, to retain them? There is, I mean, there's a competition for talent, as we say. Yeah. Uh, it depends year on year. Uh, I think Société Générale last year have done a very good year. Uh, so we, I think we, we need to uh, incentivize people to do a good job. Uh, yeah. There is a, a balance to be kept uh, between the different levels. Um, I think French banks tend to be quite reasonable uh, and there is pressure from the, the society, from investors not to be excessive. Um, so I, I think you can find a, a good, a good uh, balancing act uh, to, to incentivize and to be fair. And, and what about job cuts? I mean, one of the things, again, that we're trying to figure out from bank executives, but actually, you know, chief executives in general, do, do you, does it feel good right now from where you're sitting in terms of the economy? <clears throat> and that, will that lead to job cuts? I think um, job cuts are not necessarily the best instrument for a cyclical uh, uh, process. For structural changes, uh, I mean, nobody goes to, to bank branches anymore. So, so you need, this is a structural change and you need to adapt. And this may lead to uh, um, re-educating people and partly to let people uh, move on 
and, and, and reorganize the bank. But again, yeah. I, I think there is a difference of philosophy between continental banks, I think, and, and U.S. banks. I mean, I don't think that we need to... Uh, I mean, the, the, the instrument of adjustment is not, uh, is not labor. Uh, it's maybe bonuses, uh, but you have to keep the good people over time. Yeah. What are you most, I mean, if not excited, like I don't know what to do with chat GPT, so we have many Wall Street banks that banned it. What will the relationship be between AI through chat GPT and, and a lot of the banks? No, AI is, is fundamental on many, many issues that yeah. can be simplified. If you think about compliance issues, yeah. uh, risk management, so there is a lot that we can, can learn and improve. Yeah. We have to keep uh, the human being on top. I think uh, that's, uh, that's the challenge. Lorenzo, thank you so much for joining us today. Lorenzo Vinismaghi, uh, the chair, chair there at Societe Generale. Now, coming up, we take a deep dive into the biggest story in British politics this week. Chatham House Director and Chief Executive Bronwyn Maddox joins us to discuss the Windsor framework. That's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg UK, a new show with a special focus on the biggest challenges facing the British government, the economy, financial services and markets. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, on the show this week, the UK is pushing for closer financial services links with the European Union following the breakthrough deal on Northern Ireland. But it's not yet clear if the agreement has enough political support. Also on the program, could the Brexit deal put UK assets on the long road to recovery? We'll discuss what that means for investors and more of our interview with the chief executive of the LSE Group. It plans to buy back £750 million worth of shares from a consortium including Blackstone. Now, the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak dubbed it as a decisive breakthrough as he and his EU counterpart, Ursula von der Leyen, unveiled a post-Brexit deal on Northern Ireland trade agreements. Well, Leanne Gerens is here to walk us through the deal and what's ahead. Hi, Leanne. Francine, hello to you. So this is a breakthrough deal between the UK and the EU, really aimed at tackling one of the stickiest post-Brexit issues, Francine. That's trading rules for Northern Ireland. It's called the Windsor Framework and will reduce checks on goods travelling from Britain to Northern Ireland through a system of a green lane for goods that will stay in the region and a red lane for goods which will travel onwards to the EU, just seen on the map here. It also also introduces a new mechanism. Now that's called the Stormont Break, which will allow the Northern Irish Assembly to challenge changes to certain EU rules. This is meant to give politicians a say over how European laws do apply to them. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen described the deal as extraordinary and said it would ensure a long-lasting solution for all the parties involved. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says the agreement would protect Northern Northern Ireland's place in the Union and deliver smooth flowing trade. Now, one of the key goals is getting Northern Ireland's DUP to approve the new Brexit deal, and that's to restore power sharing in the region. Yesterday, the Democratic Unionist Party's chief whip, that's Sammy Wilson, said the party will not give a knee jerk response. This is the next piece in the puzzle for Rishi Sunak. He needs to ensure his Windsor framework is successful, and the goal is to see the Stormont Assembly up and running in time for the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Peace Agreement next month. So, Francine, we are all waiting for the DUP to give their verdict on this new and latest deal. Leanne, thank you so much. Some fabulous reporting there on exactly what we found out this week, Leanne Gerens. Now, for more, let's also bring Bronwyn Maddox, Director and Chief Executive of Chatham House. Bronwyn, thank you for joining us. Are you optimistic that it's plain smooth ahead, it's plain sailing ahead? Are we going to get this through? Well, it depends what you mean by get it through. Can Rishi Sunak get it through Parliament? Yes. Uh, Labour, the opposition, has already said yes, it will support this. Um, he has enough Conservative MPs that together with Labour can get this through. The question is how many of his own uh, Conservative MPs want to cause trouble 
uh, and whether or not the DUP comes along. That matters not so much for getting this through Parliament, but for whether the Assembly, which we were just hearing about, the Assembly in Northern Ireland, that power-sharing agreement that is Assembly that is at the, uh, the heart of the, the Good Friday Agreement of 25 years ago, whether that can get up and running, because that is the government of Northern Ireland. And we've had periods, you know, up to about three years when that, uh, when the power sharing failed and the civil servants were trying to run it. But they have been saying quite plaintively, look, there is a limit or a point when there's real political decisions, you know, that have to be taken by politicians, how much to spend on this right. or that. And so it really, it really matters, you know, to get that up and running, but it's not the same thing as the whole legislation. But do you think, first of all, that the DUP will accept Rishi Sunak's Brexit deal? They haven't said no immediately, and that has been what they've tended to say about all kinds of things. So this is, in a sense, good news. The DUP isn't any longer one entity. There are clearly very different voices in there, and there's a lot of disagreement going on. Do I think they'll all accept it? No. Do I think they'll accept it enough um, to get back uh, and, and agree to, um, to to take part in Northern Ireland government again? Uh, possibly, but they are an unpredictable uh, force in politics. They've sometimes been dubbed the party of no, um, because they can see the, their objections to things more easily than they can see, you know, a, a, a compromise way through. But they have, there are people there, Peter Robinson, within there saying, look, look at how bad it might be if we don't accept this. So there's a big argument going on. I, don't, I'm, I'm, I, w I wouldn't um, put 10 cents on I it either way, I'm afraid. I know, and it's difficult to speculate at the moment. We know that they're, if not casting doubt, certainly saying that they're still analyzing uh, the Brexit deal and won't make a knee-jerk reaction. But with every day that passes, is it more likely that they accept the deal? Bronwyn, I don't know if you can still hear me or if you're still there. The, the question was, they I'm, have I'm said... still there. It, 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 it cut out. Go on. Yeah, the, the main unionist party in Northern Ireland said they will not make a knee-jerk decision on whether to accept it. With yeah. each day that passes, is it more likely that they accept it or is it wishful thinking? I think it's more likely that they accept it with each day that passes. Um, as I said, their main reaction has tended to be in the past when they don't like something, to say so immediately. So I think they would like to find a way through, and they can see the amount of support there is for this, including among Northern Ireland uh, people and businesses. Um, but there are very unpredictable political force. I, mean, can, can I would say that each year that ahead. passes, we're not... Right. Yeah, I think you should press ahead. Uh, the, the, their electorate is getting, their voters are getting much more nuanced, much more complex. Many people who were DUP voters diehard DUP voters years ago. Now saying, well, look, we trade, I'm a small businessman, I'm a farmer, I trade across the border. I need that border to the south mm -hmm. to work. I need the border uh, with, the, 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 with the UK mainland to, to work, or there to be very little obstacle there. So I want something like this to go ahead. So I think they will get pressure from their voters. And I think Rishi Sunak, Maddox. yes, should push ahead. Thank you so much for joining us, Director and Chief Executive of Chatham House, Bronwyn Maddox. Now we'll have plenty more, of course, on the UK show. The UK and the EU finally agreeing on a post-Brexit trade deal, although for the moment it's called a framework. What does this mean for investors? Where does it leave British assets? We'll discuss that next. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg UK. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, we're just getting some breaking news out of the BOE. This is the publication of a decision maker panel survey. And they say, this is according to the BOE, it's a BOE survey saying that UK firms expect an average wage to rise 5.7% in coming years. Now, actually, in, in the coming years, in the next 12 months, that seems uh, definitely below what we have at the moment. And then we also have a little bit more, of course, insight into inflation expectations 
expectations. So inflation expectations for the same firms that the BOE has surveyed, they expect it to be 5.9% in one year and then 3.4% inflation in three years. Now, the leaders of the UK and the EU both hailed last week's post-Brexit trade deal as a chance to reset frayed relations between the two sides. But for investors in British assets, the repair work is only just beginning. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's John Stepek, who writes our money distilled newsletter. It's fantastic. So I urge everyone to go and have a look. And then also Lukia Giftopoulou, who covers the asset management beat. So thank you both for joining us. John, I love really reading your newsletter on house prices and what this means for UK <laughs> assets. First of all, how long does it take for, I guess, the, the encouraging news about better ties with Europe to filter through UK assets? I mean, that's a good question. Um, the things we, we don't know. Hard question. It's a very hard question. <laughs> exactly. If, if, I, if I knew the answer to that, I'd be on a private island somewhere. <laughs> um, no, but I think, I think the thing to understand is that uh, UK assets have been shunned by global investors yep. for the best part of seven years now. Um, and while you can argue about the economic impact of Brexit, I think you'd have to be in denial not to admit that Brexit is, you know, have, has kind of created this geopolitical discount on UK assets. Now, the main thing about the deal this week is that regardless of whether it goes through or not, we've got the, uh, you know, we've got Rishi Sunak and Ursula talking to each other like adults. Um, so the UK and the EU are no longer basically trying to you know, stab each other in the back. Um, and that kind of sign of reconciliation should hopefully remove some of the geopolitical discount that we've had hanging over us since 2016. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of follow-up questions to that. But first, Lukia, where do you see the, the best value? Or actually, where do you see the most unloved UK assets that could suddenly be getting a lot of interest? I mean, UK equities have been shunned for the past seven years. UK equity funds have seen billions and billions of outflows since the Brexit referendum. And there is the sentiment has started to turn, but it's not certain it's because of the Brexit deal. It's mainly because they're cheap. Some people say, OK, they have a five to seven year upside. So some investors have started to go back into them. And, and this is what? This is like, is it asset managers? Is, is the so UK the, market still seen as the kind of, the, you know, the beacon of, of success? It depends on who you speak to, but some of the very big asset managers like Schroeder, for example, and Fidelity International say they now like UK equities a bit more. Fidelity yeah. International said they're overweight. Yeah. Then they, they see a longer term upside. Schroeder CIO called it in a statement to us a safe harbor for now. So I think it's there is a long way to go, but something might be changing. Yeah, and, and politically, I guess, you know, you know, some of the questions that we had is we've had three prime ministers in 12 months. There's still a lot of question marks on whether Boris Johnson comes back. We have a lot of question marks of what Labour would do with some kind of deal. So what are the questions that you're hearing from from managers or investors? Well, I, I think the, the, the thing is that Rishi Sunak is seen as a safe pair of hands. Yeah. Um, but we don't know how long he stays. Well, we don't know how long he stays. But the thing is, if Keir takes over from uh, Rishi come the next election, so the next UK election has got to be held before January yep. 2025. Yep. Chances are it will be late 2024. Yep. Now, if you think about what could happen at that point, either the Conservatives stay under Rishi Sunak, most likely, or Labour kind of wins under Keir Starmer. Now, the thing is, Keir Starmer has gone a long way to rehabilitating the Labour Party mm -hmm. following the, kind of, the Corbyn regime. Um, and I think that the other thing to kind of point out is that Keir Starmer does not want Brexit to be a problem under his watch. Yeah. So if he does end up running the next government, he doesn't yeah. want to have to continue dealing with this. So I, I think that most asset managers would see that we're now in a point where you can assume that the, uh, the future path is going to be less chaotic than it has been. I mean, I've, I'm self-crowning you like, you know, political analyst on the program. <laughs> I don't know how many people, I get asked quite a lot, like, what happens to Boris Johnson? Does a Boris Johnson comeback become less likely because of the Rishi Sunak Brexit deal? I think almost certainly. I mean, I, I struggle to see, um, either, we're, we're, we're past the point yeah. where it's such a, I mean, any Conservative MP who wants to get elected next year, have any chance of holding on to their job, has to understand that the majority of the population whether they voted remain or leave, is now at the very least bored of the Brexit yeah. question. They want everyone to get over <laughs> Never. it. Never. Well, exactly. I mean, the fact that Steve Baker, who was yeah. quite a prominent kind of Brexiteer, welcomed the, uh, the, the deal, kind of shows you that I think the calculus has changed. 
Yeah. Um, and I honestly think that if Boris Johnson was to try and mount some sort of comeback, uh, it'd largely be greeted with, you know, resounding. Yeah. Uh, you know, For... <laughs> <laughs> no, they wouldn't be keen. <laughs> they wouldn't be keen. Look, yeah, uh, is, how difficult is it, first of all, to price the Brexit discount? And you wrote a wonderful piece this week that basically says, look, this Brexit deal puts disliked UK assets on a long road to recovery. I mean, what's a long road? I mean, it's very hard for me to say, and I would be in a different profession potentially if I could make these guesses, but um, five to seven years is like a time frame that we're hearing from investors. Um, now, whether this has started because of the Brexit deal again, it's, it's not 100%, it kind of started a bit before, but definitely some certainty doesn't harm. Where do you think there's, there, there's going to be the most interest? I don't know whether it's too soon to say whether it's Indian investors that say, look, now's a good time to get back. We, we you know, tried to speak to the people in charge of attracting foreign direct investment to this country, and there's still a lot of question marks of who, who will have the most appetite for UK assets. I think maybe a lot of people are still sitting on the fence because the Brexit risk has been priced in, but there, there are still worries about the upcoming election, there are problems with the union in Scotland, and the, I think some institutional investors might have started yeah. to look back into it, but specifically with locations and services, it's a bit early to tell. So John Stepick is now really going to depress us, uh, talking about house prices. So John, UK house prices slid at the sharp, sharpest annual pace since 2012. Is that on mortgages or is that really just on recessionary risk? Oh, well, that's mortgages. Okay. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think people kind of struggle to wrap their heads around this, but a house is an asset like any other. I mean, you can always price it like you would price a bond. It generates an income, and when interest rates go up, yep. you know, the, the yield you require from that goes up, and therefore the capital value of the house goes down. If you want to put it in strict financial market terms, that's basically what it is. So I would love to see a negotiation <laughs> with Foxton's. Can we just pause for one second? Should we just bring, every time you, you're looking at a place, bring John Stepick with you? <laughs> I, will, I wish. But, um, I mean, the good news is that mortgage rates are actually much lower than they were in October. Um, they've come down since then. But even if you assume that they stay at current levels, you know, you're talking about you can yeah. maybe get a five-year fix for about 3.94% just now. A year ago, you could get that for about 2%. Yeah. There's no way that can't have an impact on house prices. Now, mm. the good news, or rather the kind of the fingers crossed scenario, is that house prices adjust and become more affordable largely in real terms so because of inflation house prices are actually in real terms down about 11 percent from their peak in august uh, and they're down about four percent in nominal terms what you ideally want is for about half of it to be real terms and half of it to be nominal because a 20 percent fall in nominal terms would only take us back to pre-pandemic levels. Right. So at that point, you're probably talking about there's a very small number of people who would be suffering from negative equity. It wouldn't be terribly catastrophic from an economic point of view. But if it falls by, say, kind of 30% in real terms, that means that first-time buyers yeah. you know, can get on yeah. the ladder. Yeah. Um, you kind of diffuse some of the, the political toxicity yeah. of the housing market. And actually, that, so that would be a, a, good outcome, yeah. a good outcome, yeah. John, thank you so much. We have an industry secret. I think John Stepick's DMs are open on Twitter, so if you're buying a house, <laughs> just DM with, with mortgage advice. You're welcome, John. John nice. Stepick and Lucia Giftopolu. Now, coming up, chip designer John, uh, Arm decides against selling shares in London. We'll bring you our interview with the London Stock Exchange Group Chief Executive Officer. He's David Schwimmer. And that's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. We regularly work uh, with the UK government. Uh, I think it's a good level of cooperation. We work closely with stakeholders in this market. We work closely with uh, governments and regulators in other markets as well, uh, whether that's in France, in the US, uh, in Asia. So uh, it's, it's a core part of what we do. Uh, and we uh, have a, a significant uh, regulatory footprint. So uh, it's just part of a core competency for LSEG. And, uh, of course, one, one thing the government was trying to do in, in terms of strengthening the finances of the City of London specifically was trying to court an arm listing 
in London. Um, and of course, ARM used to be listed in London in about 2016 before it was acquired by SoftBank. But we learned today that SoftBank is going to be going for a U.S. listing. How big of a blow is this, David, to have the homegrown tech company not come back home? So ARM is a great British company. Uh, London continues to be uh, a fantastic listing venue and the most international listing venue. I'm not going to comment on any uh, specific or the latest uh, speculation on where it's going to list. Uh, but I think there's a great conversation actually going on in the UK markets at this point. Uh, and this is not about, it's not about listing rules. Uh, it's not about listing regulation. Uh, there's an opportunity to implement some of the reforms that the government is looking at, implement some of the reforms that the capital markets industry task force is working on that will continue to make London uh, that much more of a competitive and attractive listing destination and financial Wait, center. So, so but, David, uh, David, quickly then, do you think that, are you still holding out hope that ARM might list in London? As I said, I'm not going to speculate on, this has been an ongoing saga for a couple of years, I'm not going to speculate on the latest. That was David Schwimmer, the chief executive officer of the London Stock Exchange Group, speaking to our Danny Berger. Now, SoftBank-owned Arm is said to have decided against selling shares on the London Stock Exchange. We all know that we were just hearing uh, from the LSE Group chief executive. Where does this leave politicians? Where does it leave tech giants in general? Well, we have one person who's been following this from the very beginning, Bloomberg's Caroline Hepker, recently speaking to Arm's co-founder, Jamie Urquhart. Caroline joins us now. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. I mean, you did some great reporting. You went on the ground, of course, in Oxford as well. What prompted this decision? Well, this is the issue. Perhaps frustration. Bloomberg's Ruth David actually broke the story around the issue that there won't be a listing in London, we don't think, according yeah. to Bloomberg sources. Um, is it frustration? Three prime ministers in the space of a year. We know that the government has been lobbying arm to list in the UK. Um, and yet there has been political uncertainty. There has been you know, a dormant IPO market effectively in London. So the backdrop has not been good. So I was speaking to one of the co-founders of Arm, actually somebody who took the business public back in 1998. Yeah. He then became the COO. Um, he's deeply involved in technology and electronics. And he was actually really pretty scathing about how the government has uh, handled matters and the backdrop for innovative businesses in Britain. There's been very little continuity, there's been very little strategy and even now we're waiting for the government to, to come out with a, a semiconductor strategy. It doesn't take that much to, to start looking forward and thinking about what you're going to do, but you've got to do it. I think the government are just either unwilling to grasp the nettle or maybe they've got way too many things to do and aren't thinking about it. So how much of this, Carolina, is the political situation? How much of it is, is just actually just NASDAQ offers better valuations? It's a bigger market. It has more investors. Yeah, absolutely. Masayoshi-san um, has always been very focused on the U.S. listing and has made that very clear that the investor base, the, the pool of money and yeah. markets in the U.S. is very attractive. I think that it would have been a big coup for Rishi Sunak and the government had they managed to get the listing here in London. But now, actually, a secondary listing looks in great doubt. Yeah, Caroline, thank you so much for the great reporting, Caroline. Hepker there. Now, be sure, of course, to subscribe also to Bloomberg's In the City podcast that I host along with David Merritt on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We have a new art going with, of course, the podcast, and today's episode is about football. This is Bloomberg. we're seeing in, in the Eurozone is, is, is more of an, an overheating in terms of inflation pressures. Equities are not pricing in the risks of a tighter Fed, a tighter ECB that are pushing rates further into restrictive territory. We've had negative real interest rates in Europe since the financial crisis and it's time to straighten that out so that investment doesn't get misallocated and so the economy can grow in a healthy way. That's a good outcome here. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. It is 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. The latest inflation numbers for the euro area are just crossing. The data likely to be the crucial factor in determining what the ECB does next on interest rates. 
Elon Musk's master plan for Tesla, it falls flat with investors. He fails to offer any firm details on the company's next generation of electric vehicles. And this could feed the worst fears of crypto watchdogs. Silvergate Capital warns that it needs time to figure out just how badly it was hurt by last year's crypto rout. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Matt Miller, of course, in New York. Anna Edwards is off. We're going to check the markets, of course, on the inflation data. But, Matt, you're going to start with what's been happening in the U.S. Yeah, quick look at futures because we are down um, after a down day on the S&P and the cash trade yesterday. The Dow actually eked out a gain, but the Dow and the Nasdaq were down. S&P futures now off about two-thirds of 1%, as you can see here. And the U.S. 10-year yield remains above 4%. Right now, it's up five basis points to 4 spot 0418 so it continues to rise, and it's very likely that the European inflation data you're about to uh, talk to us about is really adding upward pressure on these yields. The U.S. dollar index right now about a quarter percent at 1251.79, um, so itself inching ever higher here, as is NYMEX crude, 78.06. We're up $2 compared to where we were yesterday, 37 cents on the close. So that continues to rise as well on the China reopening after we got positive data there. Tom, what do you see in terms of that inflation data? Well, Matt, this is the standout. It's core inflation at a record level now in the Eurozone, 5.6%. That was above the Bloomberg economics estimates, above the estimates, the consensus estimates coming through around the surveys. And therein lies the conundrum then for the ECB, the challenge for the ECB. We heard from Madeleine Lagarde, of course, the president of the central bank, speaking earlier, saying that more work will need to be done, that March is likely going to be 50 basis points. But the market's now starting to think about where we go from here. 2.5% is where rates are at across the Eurozone. Do we get to 4%? That is the market pricing. And how much does that adjust as well on the back of this very strong inflation data once again? So 5.6% core if you strip out energy and food prices. And that's been doing some work as well. So the yield story, you're absolutely right to zero on on that because there's been a lot of work being done there in terms of the sell-off across sovereign bonds. And German bonds as well in focus. And we'll bring that to your attention. 324 then, a move of four basis points. In the last 30 days, you've seen about 70 basis points in terms of the move higher in German yields. And, of course, you've seen that around the peripheries as well. And that's a concern, of course, for the Eurozone as well. The BTPs, Spanish and German debt. Euro dollar 106, just down four-tenths of a percent. Dollar, of course, stronger in the session. A couple of corporate stories to bring to your attention on the earnings front. The world's biggest brewer, AB InBev. Top line, it was a beat in terms of the earnings for the fourth quarter on profits. But then concern about, about volumes. They dropped, actually, for the first time since the early stages of the pandemic and softness in your market in the U.S. as well. So potential concerns for AB InBev going forward in terms of the demand outlook. And when it comes to the London Stock Exchange, we had a Bloomberg scoop about the fact that Arm, of course, the semiconductor designer that is owned by SoftBank, is no longer going to be looking. It's ruled out a listing on the London Stock Exchange. So a blow there for the LSE group. They also came out from earnings. They did raise their dividends as well. So a slightly brighter pitch on the earnings front, but concerns if you don't get the likes of Arm listing on the London Stock Exchange. Currently down 1.4%, Matt. We're also going to get more uh, euro area inflation, of course, in terms of the details, in terms of the context, and who better to join us than our Europe correspondent, Maria, today, to give us that context. Maria. Uh, look, Tom, this was a, the number, the data that we were expecting the entire morning. We now have it. Uh, you went through the numbers, but let's go through the numbers uh, once again. Headline inflation for February in the euro area came in at 8.5 percent. It is a slightly tick up down from the previous month when it was 8.6 percent. But when you look at core inflation, and this is really the print that the European Central Bank pays attention to, you see that jumps to 5.6 percent compared to 5.3 uh, the previous month. Obviously, Obviously, the two numbers are way above the target for the European Central Bank. The data today obviously matters in the context of this upcoming decision in two weeks' time from the European Central Bank. 50 basis point hiked, very much baked in. The data today, to some extent, is also not a surprise. If you look at the prints uh, that we already had from Spain, from France, from Germany, that shows this battle to bring down inflation is far from over. You were at the Bundesbank yesterday. What did Joachim Nagel tell you? Well, to some extent, uh, the data that we have today will validate his case because what he told me is you have to read through uh, the energy effects on inflation and focus on the core, and that is problematic. And he told me at this point, when you look at the data that we have, when you look at the signals that are coming 
from the economy. Those 50 basis points in March are very necessary. Let's have a look. It, it seems to be the case that inflation is very stubborn. And that is bringing me to the point that monetary policy has to be more stubborn. It's not fair to speculate what is the sequencing beyond March, but it looks like for the moment that 50 basis points for the March meeting, very necessary. And that was obviously the head of the Bundesbank, Mr. Nagel, speaking to us uh, yesterday. Now, he says it's not fair to speculate beyond March, but Matt, you know the speculation will be now entirely on May, given the data that we have. Are we going to see now back-to-back -back 50 basis points, March going into May, too? That's essentially where the debate is at. Yeah, absolutely. There are already bets on uh, more than 4%, um, pricing in of more than 4%, expectations for the terminal rate in Europe. People are betting on 6% here in the U.S. So we really see um, this inflation data putting upward pressure on those expectations. Maria Tadeo talking to us um, out of, where, where is she? Where are you? Are you in Frankfurt? Brussels. Brussels. No, okay. Brussels. Back in Brussels, uh, the European capital. I have Thanks. to sleep in my bed at one point, Matt. That's, that, that's good. I'm glad you finally <laughs> got a chance to get home after globetrotting. Uh, she was in Poland, then she was in uh, Ukraine, then she was in Frankfurt, and now she's back in Brussels. So uh, good that she's back home. Let's get to what the Fed, uh, Tom, is talking about. Yeah, of course, the Fed now, officials, we've been hearing from Novo Notes, saying interest rates will need to increase further, of course, and stay elevated into next year, as inflation, of course, shows very little signs of abating. Uh, President, of course, Neil Kashkari, Fed President, spoke yesterday. Take a listen. I'm open-minded at this point about whether it's 25 or 50 basis points. To me, much, what's much more important than whether it's 25 or 50 is what we signal in what's called the dot plot. Okay, that was, of course, a Minneapolis Fed president there speaking in terms of the signaling around the dot plot. For more analysis, let's bring in Bloomberg's Valerie Titel uh, for some context. Valerie, Kashkari then mentioning that if his terminal rate expectation is moving high, did he give any details on whether he thinks that that terminal rate and his view, his dot plot, is going to be moving higher? Look, he, he really stopped short of signaling that his dot is definitely moving higher, but he put a lot of emphasis on it. Remember, we get the up, updated dot plot at their next meeting in March. Kashkar is one of the most hawkish members. He's at 5.4 terminal rate. How much higher is that going to shift in the dot plot that we get in March? That is the big question. But look, he stopped short of saying it definitively. He said instead we should not overreact to one month of data. But he did call the recent data concerning. Let me show you something that was concerning in the ISM manufacturing print yesterday, Tom. It was the prices paid sub-index. Many see this as a leading indicator for goods inflation. It unexpectedly jumped, possibly hinting that goods disinflation will slow in the next CPI print. What, uh, we, we've seen this bond sell off. It's been pretty relentless. We're getting back to um, the highest levels we've seen in 10-year treasuries in some time. I think we're at a November uh, level. What could cause that to turn around? It has been relentless in all of February. Yields have been on a one-way track higher. After that ISM print, we had the twos tens curve inverting to a new low. It hit negative 90 basis points yesterday, and two-year yields crept higher in the Asia session overnight. The big kicker for this, in order to see some sort of, uh, of, of give up on this yield move, we're going to need to see some softening data. We have U.S. jobless claims today. We also have ISM services on Friday. Any hint of a softening data could maybe see this yield sell-off pause. All right, uh, Valerie, we'll watch for that initial jobless claims uh, and continuing cl claims coming out at 8.30 a.m. Um, we'll pay very close attention, obviously, on surveillance. Thanks to Bloomberg's Valerie Titel. Now, Elon Musk's much-hyped master plan for Tesla fell flat with investors. The four-hour presentation yesterday failed to offer any firm detail on the company's next generation of electric cars, and the current generation is looking very long in the tooth indeed. Executives touted Tesla's ability to get production facilities up and running quickly, and Musk expanded on his plans for a lithium refinery in Texas. We need to make just a, a very uh, giant amount of anode cathode lithium lithium hydroxide lithium, lithium carbonate it, it, there's it's really the refining capacity that is uh the, the biggest choke point um 
Yeah, so that's, what, that's why we're building a lithium refinery in Corpus Christi. All right, that's the kind of in-the-weeds commentary that investors weren't really psyched about. Elizabeth Behrman, Bloomberg EMEA Auto's team leader, joins us now for more. So what does Tesla's push beyond making batteries further into the upstream tell us? What's the takeaway for, for other car makers as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, Tesla, as we know, is already very well, in, in highly integrated compared to other car makers. But um, with the comments that we just heard from Elon Musk, they very much echo what we're hearing from Volkswagen and from BMW as well, that they're really concerned about sufficient lithium uh, refining capacity in particular. And as we see car make EVs uh, go into the mainstream for uh, traditional car makers as well, they will be very closely watching what Tesla is doing and they'll be put on notice by this move, no doubt. What, what are the potential pitfalls of this move then? I mean, I mean, going very much up or down on what your core expertise is, is obviously going to, has the risk of uh, you ending up sp being spread way too thinly. Um, then again, Tesla is quite experienced in this, but their core expertise remains in car making. Uh, over the past couple of years, 90% um, of their revenue and profit, all of that came from selling cars. On the other hand, setting up a refinery, that's not the same thing as uh, setting up a mine, which would be really outside of what Tesla is uh, good at and known for. All right, Bloomberg's Elizabeth Behrman talking to us about the Tesla report yesterday. I think most of us watching uh, the, the car maker are waiting for the Cybertruck, waiting for the design language to break away from the decade-old look um, that was kicked off with the Model S. Let's take a look at some of the stocks that we're watching in the pre-market today. Aside from Tesla, it is down in the pre-market trade, but um, Microsoft is off as well. We're watching that as the Biden administration is set to release an aggressively uh, an aggressive new national cybersecurity strategy today. It looks to shift the blame from companies that get hacked to software manufacturers and device makers, putting it on a potential collision course with big technology. Senior U.S. officials have publicly complained that tech companies, including Microsoft, have failed to sufficiently secure user accounts. And we're going to have more on that story later in this hour. Silvergate in the crypto space plunging. Uh, in pre-market, it is a crypto-friendly bank. It has said a number of things. One, it can't file its annual report right now. That's a red flag. Two, indicated it's being investigated by the Justice Department. Bloomberg has reported that already. And three, it said its accountant has asked for proof that it can continue as an ongoing concern, meaning will it be able to stay in business or collapse? Those worries are what's driving it down 30% in pre-market trading. Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong was on with us yesterday, reiterated that the largest U.S. crypto exchange's staking product should not be classified as a security amid a broad regulatory crackdown by the SEC. Gary Gensler disagrees. The stock is already down 83 percent so far in 2023, and it's falling another three and a third percent today. And then on the upside, CRM, Salesforce, it gave an upbeat forecast for the coming year, and it plans to step up its stock buybacks. Operating margin is going to be 27% for the fiscal year. That trounced an average analyst estimate of 22.4%, and it increased its share repurchase program to $20 billion. Investors like that a lot, and that's why it's up 15% in the pre-market. Tom? All right, coming up, Eric Nelson, Wells Fargo macro strategist. We'll be getting his views, of course, on the inflation question for these central banks and how to position. And we're going to talk the global energy crisis. Of course, that ties into inflation very clearly with the CEO of SoCal Gas, a California utility company. What more can they do around pricing for consumers and businesses? Plus, how a 90s rapper got sucked into the 1MDB scandal. This is a fascinating story. Read more on today's Big Take story online or on the Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. We are simulcast on both radio and television. If you are listening on radio, I've got a chart. Um, this is one of those rare instances where 
uh, lacking the visuals is going to help you better understand the point. Basically, European investment grade bond issuance is at the highest level this year than it has been in the last five years at this point. And actually, it has been um, for many points this year. There are a, a number of different lines uh, making this a, a bit of a spider chart. That's a new term um, that I've just been introduced uh, to by Priscilla Azevedo Roca. She is a Bloomberg credit reporter. She joins us live out of London to talk about, you know, the point essentially, Priscilla, is that we're still at a high in terms of issuance at the end of February, beginning of March. Uh, why is that as we see these rates uh, rising ever higher? Hi, Matt. Good morning. So it's exactly that, right? So we had historical high rate, uh, high issuance this year. So companies are selling bonds like no, never before. And this is only a sign of anxiety. It's anxiety by companies and treasurers. The rates are going to be higher for longer. So they need to get in and they need to sell their bonds before it's too late. And today's inflation print is just one more proof to that, right? It's going to become more expensive to the point that it can get even prohibitively expensive to do so. So, so the data today kind of justifies that anxiety. Where is that anxiety most acute? Which sectors, which companies are at the forefront of issuance? At the forefront of issuance right now is investment grade companies, right? Because they still have the ratings, they still have market access, and investors are still buying into them. We've seen earlier this week bonds from like McDonald's, from BASF in Germany. So those are national champion names that people like to buy and they know them well. But on the other side of this equation, we have junk companies, right? Uh, access for those have become more complex over this year as rates shoot higher. On the IG part of that equation then, is that demand holding up? Are we at peak issuance at this point and are the buyers going to still be out there? So that's a good question, Tom, because the thing is, uh, we're still seeing a lot of supply in the market, but investors are turning sour and on mm. cre like in credit, right? Uh, we came into 2023 thinking, oh, this is going to be the year of the bond. Uh, January was great. Uh, it, it was approved to that and returns were stellar. Then came into February, things turned sour and investors were like, mm, we don't like this anymore. So returns in this February was like the worst ever for a February in history. Wow. Wow. Well, that says something, doesn't it? Fantastic mm. insights. Thank you. Really important story to bring to our viewers' attention. Bloomberg's Priscilla Azevedo Roca, thank you. And for more market analysis, of course, uh, from Priscilla and the rest of the team, check out MLive Go on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Tom McKenzie in London. Anna Edwards is off today. Now, keeping you up to date, with the news from around the world, here's the first word. The European Union is set to propose a plan to provide Ukraine with much needed ammunition. It calls for the immediate transfer of ammo, especially artillery rounds from existing stocks. The proposal is also envisioning a ramp up uh, of Europe's capacity to meet current and future needs. In China, a sign that President Xi Jinping's campaign to tighten the Communist Party's grip on the financial system has a long way to go. Chinese bankers are being told to change their mindsets, clean up what's called their hedonistic lifestyles, and quit copying Western ways. The warning came in a commentary from China's top anti-corruption watchdog. The Chicago Fed hired a search firm to help find its new president, Austin Goolsby. One of the diversified search group's executives is none other than Goolsby's wife, Robin. The Fed says it was aware of Robin Goolsby's position at the firm and that she had no involvement in the search. SpaceX launched a four-person crew to the International Space Station early today. The crew includes two Americans, a Russian, and an astronaut from the United Arab Emirates. They'll arrive at the space station on Friday, and they stay there, Tom, for what I'm being told is um, the typical, the standard six months, which seems like, to me, a long time to sit in the International Space Station. <laughs> six months! That is, that is quite the stint, isn't it? You'd hope that the relationships between those individuals is going to be strong to sustain them through that period. So, yeah, Kate, taking off the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, I don't know if you managed to watch it, Matt, but uh, always impressive to see this. Yeah, it's amazing. I did uh, watch a replay of it, and we just showed some video. It's always yeah. impressive to me that SpaceX, that a private company, is launching actual people up in space, and 
uh, hopefully someday soon to the moon. Yeah, ninth manned mission, seventh to the International Space Station. Coming up, Eric Nilsson, Wells Fargo macro strategist. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg's Values Early Edition, and here's what you need to know. Euro area inflation slowed by less than anticipated, while underlying price pressures surged to a new record. The data likely to be the crucial factor in determining what the ECB does next on interest rates. Elon Musk's master plan for Tesla falls flat with investors. He fails to offer any firm details on the company's next generation of electric vehicles and... This could feed the worst fears of crypto watchdogs. Silvergate Capital warns that it needs time to figure out just how badly it was hurt by last year's crypto rout. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Matt Miller, of course, in New York. Anna Edwards is off today. And Matt, beyond the corporate stories around Tesla, the focus, of course, on that hot and unexpected, at least core inflation, out of the eurozone yeah absolutely i mean that inflation number a record high in the core is uh putting upward pressure on rates in europe and it's really traveling around the world so let's see what's going on here in u.s markets first s p futures down about half a percent right now this after the drop in the cash trade yesterday um so we're down i think the cash close was somewhere around 39.50 down well under 4,000, and we could fall further this morning. The U.S. 10-year yield climbs to the highest level we've seen this year, up over 4% yesterday. It's up another four basis points right now at 403, and this is really the highest level we've seen since November. We're getting back to that um, 2022 record of 424, I think 425 was the record high. Oh, we touched on 10-year yields. We may revisit that. The Bloomberg U.S. dollar index climbing today. It was down yesterday, but up again to 1251. Now we're again 100 points away from the high that we saw last year. But this really puts pressure on risk assets as well. The stronger dollar um, puts pressure on stocks, for one thing, around the world. And that's not going to be a good thing for the open this morning. And then NYMEX crude finally going a little bit higher. I've been waiting after the good data that we had out of China overnight yesterday and the reopening talk that we've had over the past th few weeks and months to really drive um, commodities and crude. It hasn't yet, but maybe it's starting. We're looking at WTI at 78.20 a barrel. In terms of pre-market movers, Silvergate is one that Tom mentioned. It's always a concern when a bank, especially a crypto-friendly bank, says it's not really aware of the damage done by what happened last year. They should know minute by minute how they're doing financially, right? They, they don't know, so they couldn't file their annual report yet. They also indicated they're being investigated by the Justice Department, which Bloomberg has already reported. And they said their accountant has asked for further data so they can confirm that the company can still survive. Worries of a collapse driving the stock down uh, 30%. Coinbase falling maybe a little bit in sympathy there. Also, Brian Armstrong, the CEO, was on with Shanali Basak here yesterday and pushing back against the SEC and Gary Gensel's assertion that staking, um, what it does for Ethereum um, and other proof of stake uh, um, uh, blockchains is not a security, certainly the way they operate it, the SEC thinks it is. Plug Power is down after reporting net revenue for the fourth quarter that missed the average analyst estimate. Um, uh, so you can see uh, some EV companies are getting hit like Tesla, but also Plug net uh, revenue was up 36% at Plug compared to the same quarter a year ago to $221 million. But the problem is est analyst estimates were for $264 million. So a big miss there. And a beat from Salesforce, at least in terms of the forecast for the coming year, it was very upbeat and stock buybacks don't hurt. Operating margins at Salesforce are going to be 27% in this fiscal year. That trounces the average analyst estimate of 22.4%. And Salesforce says it's going to buy back $20 billion worth of shares. Investors like it. It's up more than 15% in the pre-market. Tom, what do you see in Europe? 
Yeah, Matt, at least the earnings story slightly overshot, at least here in Europe for now, as we look at this inflation data, central banks back in terms of the front of the agenda for many of these investors. And yes, we had that core inflation, a record uh, for, of course, uh, the European or the Eurozone. So the adjustment there, 50 basis points, as Maria was saying, is essentially baked in uh, for March, for the, month of, for the month of March from the ECB. The question is, does that happen again? Do you get another 50 basis points, of course, in May? So European equities are lower, and that is a factor, certainly. There hasn't been a huge move in terms of sovereign debt because of course we have seen a run-up in yields and of course the context and I'll just bring in focus the two-year the front end of the German debt market 321 there the context over the last 30 days or so you've seen a run-up about 75 basis points not a lot of change here not hugely surprising of course on the inflation front given the surprises upside that we saw from the likes of Germany France and Italy but nonetheless we are continuing to watch what is happening in terms of sell-off on the bond space euro dollar 106 hasn't been a lot of change in terms of the single currency over the last few days just softer by four tenths of percent a large part of that is going to be dollar strength of course and it's individual corporate stories to bring to your attention the world's biggest brewer AB InBev fourth quarter profits actually came in a slight beat but the volumes dropped for the first time since the early stages of the pandemic there's certainly concern about the demand in the key US market as well whether or not they can continue to push through prices Bloomberg Intelligence says it's going to be a challenging year for AB InBev. Of course, the inflation picture consequential for them. The London Stock Exchange, a Bloomberg scoop that Arm will not be listing on the London Stock Exchange. So a blow there for the political class of the UK, but also, of course, for the London Stock Exchange group, currently down 1.8%. Arm, of course, owned by SoftBank. They're going to look to the US. Matt. All right, Tom, thanks very much for that. Let's talk now about the macro picture again with Eric Nelson. He's a Wells Fargo macro strategist and joins us after, Eric, we got um, uh, record high core inflation for the Eurozone, continuing to get prints that are higher than um, economists in our say survey at least have estimated. Um, is it a concern to you? And do you think that the ECB is going to go, have to go well above 4%? I'm not sure that the, the ECB is going to be able to necessarily get much above 4%. I think 50 uh, basis points is pretty much set for the next meeting. Could well see another 50 basis points. The question for me, on the, and looking at the currency reaction today, I think that's so interesting. Because for the last 15 years or so, strong inflation has tended to be very positive for a currency because it means a more hawkish central bank, higher nominal rates. What we're seeing today, though, is euro is not outperforming. And I think this could be the start of a regime shift where if you have de-anchored inflation and the central bank can't do a lot about it, that may not be so currency positive anymore. And I want to really watch this theme and this space going forward. OK, so the movement around euro dollar, the lack of movement, could signal potentially a de-anchoring de there. In the yield space, is there a concern? Have they addressed the concern about the peripheries as they move up to potentially 4%, as some of the markets expect? Does the periphery become more of a concern or do they have the tools to address that? Well, I think what's been so remarkable, Tom, in this market reaction to the, the higher terminal rate and also the higher yields is you've actually seen a greater reaction in German yields as opposed to some of the periphery, which I think has got to be very comforting for the ECB. Hmm. And I think it allows them to continue to be relatively hawkish as long as that periphery risk remains relatively contained for right now. What is the adjustment that is needed from these equity markets to the higher rate scenario that's coming through from the ECB? Have equity markets properly adjusted to this new reality? Well, what's been so interesting about the European market reaction is actually a lot of the move has come in the terms of, of, of nominal yields and not so much real yields. So a lot of it is, is inflation compensations rising. And so that's not necessarily super negative for European equities. So until we see the real yield picture start to change, European equities can maybe hang in there. Hmm. We've seen uh, the real yield picture change here. At least that's what Jerome Powell points to when he says financial conditions has tightened. Of course, the rest of the Wall Street is like, what? Um, financial conditions are really very loose by our measures. What do you think of the Fed's path um, to beating inflation? And are they going to have similar problems? Well, what's really key to me about uh, the Fed at this juncture is that they're committed to sticking with 25 basis point hikes. And that's a huge shift from last year when they were going in 50 and 75 basis incre point increments. So if you see a little bit of a reacceleration in activity here, even if you're still of the view that a recession's coming in the second half of the year, which we are, if the Fed is not going to lean against that acceleration in activity, that can, I think, help risk stay supported for the next little while here. Very different story in the second half if we see uh, the growth environment start to turn negative. But for right now, we can be a little more constructive in the, in the risk environment. The, um the 
labor market seems to be really the linchpin here, Eric. Do, am I reading that right? I mean, if we start to get a real move up in unemployment, that's when the Fed starts to consider a pause or a pivot. I think that's absolutely right, Matt. And that's really where the recession tends to start. The reason we haven't seen a change in spending patterns, we haven't seen a real fall off in, in that very strong consumer sector in the U.S. is because the labor market's been rock solid. And until that changes, the Fed's going to continue to, to move in 25 basis in point increments. You probably see more cuts priced out. Again, until we start to see that real weakening in whether it's jobless claims, payrolls, those really key labor market indicators that tend to be warning signs that a recession's either already here or, or looming very, very soon. Eric, 489 at the front end on the two year in the US. How much more work needs to be done at the front end, do you think? Well, I think the terminal rate, Tom, is pretty well priced. To me, is how much more of these cuts in the U.S. are priced out in the end of uh, this year and really the, end, uh, the beginning of next year. That's where I think more upside can come in the front end. But as you get closer to five, especially with where the terminal rate's priced, you start to think about that's probably close to a top. Mm. Do you think we get to 5%? I think, I think we do. We get there. Yeah. Okay. Eric Nelson, fantastic analysis. Thank you very much indeed of Wells Fargo on the inflation data out of the Eurozone. Of course, the prospects around further hikes from the Federal Reserve. The big risk is if they have to go back up to 50 basis points. Now, Chevron's CEO is optimistic about China's reopening. Part of our interview is next. Stay tuned. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, an interview with Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse is at 1.30 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Tom McKenzie in London. Anna Edwards is off today. Now, Chevron CEO Mike Wirth says rising Chinese oil demand and dwindling spare production capacity around the world may push crude prices higher later this year. He spoke with Bloomberg's Alex Steele yesterday. We raised our dividend. We're investing to grow. Last year was our largest U.S. production ever. The Permian's going to grow another 10% mm -hmm. this year. Uh, the balance sheet's very strong, and the, the cash that we have surplus to that, we've always distributed back to shareholders through a buyback. The company's stronger today than it was just a few years ago, so the numbers are larger, but the approach is very consistent. So the White House has not called you yet? I haven't gotten a call. Okay, I'm, I'm just asking. You never know. Um, the, the other part of that, though, is that a lot of investors would much rather have you buy something than deliver a juicy buyback like this. What do you say to that? Consistently, well, you're saying no. Well, just because you can buy something doesn't mean you should buy something. You should buy the right thing at the right time. And I think we've got a track record of well-timed M&A. We were the first one uh, during the downturn mm -hmm. in COVID to, uh, to do a deal with Noble Energy, which has been a very, very good deal. A uh, nice deal with Renewable Energy Group uh, last year. So we've not been reluctant uh, to do acquisitions, but they have to make sense. They have to create value for shareholders. They have to fit with our portfolio. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll continue to be patient. So I think where it becomes the broader issue then is that everyone's looking for a catalyst. Like everyone likes your story. All the analysts like your story, but they're all neutral. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them are neutral on the stock. There's no juicy catalyst. There's no extra bump. The stock has not performed in, in line with Exxon, say, or even BP after its recent announcement a couple of weeks ago. Well, the whole industry is re-rating. Uh, this is an industry that for a decade languished relative to, to the rest of the market. And uh, frankly, over the last couple of years, we've, I think our story's gotten traction with, with shareholders mm -hmm. and, and we've performed very well. I see other companies now that are, are, are experiencing some of the same kinds of things. The sector as a whole is still undervalued, Alex. Uh, last year, we generated 12% of the cash flow in the S&P 500, yet only represent 5% of the market capitalizations. The multiples and the valuation that's attributed to the strong cash flows in our industry are not yet showing up in, uh, in, in stock price. So we're seeing a lot of companies now coming back. Everybody's kind of had their own journey to get mm -hmm. where they are. And uh, I think the sector still has a lot of room to improve. How does Chevron not be boring? Well, we're predictable. Uh, we're doing <laughs> what we said we would do. Uh, sometimes that's called boring. Sometimes that's called safe, reliable, steady, and, uh, and predictable. And I think we've been consistent. We've been disciplined. 
We, we've said what we're going to do. We said we're going to deliver higher returns and lower carbon. Uh, we have seen in returns improve significantly. We laid out a plan to grow free cash flow 10% per year for the next five years, carbon intensity down 30%, and we're distributing cash to shareholders. So we're doing it all. Do you feel pressure to close the gap with Exxon stock, for example, when you've really outperformed them for so long? Well, it's a long, it's a long cycle game. Mm -hmm. uh, Exxon's had their own journey. We've had our own journey. Uh, they're a great company. Uh, they're performing very well. They're a worthy rival. Uh, I enjoy uh, the, <laughs> the, the partnership we have with them in some places and the competition we have with them elsewhere. And, uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to see them and others in the industry doing well. What is an environment where you would consider another acquisition? Is it dependent on the oil price? Is it dependent <clears throat> on the Permian and peak Permian? Like what? What does Mike look at to know whether or not it's time to pull a trigger? Well, we're constantly looking at companies. And, and really, you know, the first thing you look at is um, asset quality. Mm -hmm. uh, are these assets we would invest in? Would they make our portfolio stronger? Uh, we look at strategic fit. Do they fill any gaps that we might believe that we have? Uh, we look at valuation. Uh, we look at uh, financials. Can, w are the financials accretive to our base case? And mm -hmm. we've got a very strong base case. So you've got to have a deal that really creates value in order to do better than what the, the, the steady as she goes case is. And then, of course, you, you want a company that wants to transact. We don't do hostile transactions. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to have a counterparty that, that's ready. Uh, so there's a whole confluence of events that have to come together. We're always looking. Uh, sometimes we're actually talking. Uh, but, uh, you know, when we have something, we'll come and, and I'll talk to you. About. Chevron CEO Mike Worth speaking with Bloomberg's Alex Steele yesterday and saying that he expects crude prices to face upward pressure due to the reopening. This is something we expect have been expecting, Tom, for a long time, right? It's just not clear, it seems, from the market reaction um, whether investors believe that crude is going to go much higher. Otherwise, why wouldn't they buy it now? Well, this was a conversation we were having with Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs yesterday in the London studio, and he's saying, look, the demand coming through from China will offset any slowdown that we're seeing in the U.S. But he says pivotal for investors will be that moment when the Fed either pauses or cuts. He says that is when the money will flow in. Yeah, well, uh, I think everyone is and has been waiting for that moment for like a yeah. year now. If you could call that moment... I believe you would have it made, or at least you wouldn't have lost money, as much money as you did last year. Coming up, we're going to speak with the CEO of energy pipeline company Enbridge, Greg Ebel. That's at 10.30 a.m. New York time, 3.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg's Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London with Matt Miller in New York. Anna Edwards is off today. Now a look at what is ahead today. Retail earnings continue with Macy's and Best Buy reporting for the U.S. Open, of course, consequential for the strength of the U.S. consumer. ECB minutes, they're out at 7.30 a.m. Eastern time as we debate whether or not a 50 basis point hike comes through from May, let alone March. U.S. initial jobless claims out at 8.30 a.m. And at 9.45 a.m., Washington Bureau Chief Peggy Collins will be speaking with U.S. Secretary of State Gina Raimondo. Matt. All right. Uh, we have, speaking of um, the U.S. administration, the Biden administration, um, it is on a potential collision course with big tech companies. Of course, it has been on a collision course of big tech companies, and so was the last administration. But uh, today, the Biden administration is coming out with an aggressive new cybersecurity strategy. The plan seeks to shift the blame from companies that get hacked, if you were blaming them, to software manufacturers and device makers. Joining us now to discuss is Bloomberg Tech reporter Agatha Cantrill. Aggie, um, what could this strategy mean for big tech, especially for Microsoft? Yes, so essentially a crucial part of this is shifting that onus from the users and from the companies that use these platforms and use this software to the companies that develop it. This is something that the Biden administration has been sounding the alarm about in the past, especially when it comes to Microsoft, questioning the extent to which Microsoft has actually been protecting its users, uh, its end users, when it comes um, to its cybersecurity measures. And so a big part of this is essentially what that means for legislation that can be developed 
developed to make sure that the responsibility lies with those big tech platforms. And what we're seeing is essentially this is yet another attempt on the part of the Biden administration to rein in these tech platforms. Um, but there is a hope that they could potentially be able to develop legislation that they would be able to be push, they would be able to push through Congress. Um, but as of yet, that hasn't been successful for other legislation of this kind. No, it hasn't. And of course, hacks have been a long term headache for, for big tech and the businesses that use that technology. Why is the stricter approach coming now, Aggie? There's a part of it, Tom, which is essentially about this being, uh, there being a lot of bipartisan appetite for strengthening cybersecurity. And something I noticed recently when I was uh, looking at the tech companies that were at the Munich Security Conference a couple of weeks ago, uh, cybersecurity has also become an inherent part of national security for a lot of countries. And cybersecurity, when it comes to Microsoft, when it comes to Google, all of these companies were present at the Munich Security Conference and indicating the huge role that cybersecurity plays. And we see this also uh, being rolled out in Ukraine where the cyber security and securing the, uh, the cyber infrastructure of Ukraine has been a critical part of their war effort against the Russians. And so this is also not just saying that this is a company concern, but also it's a national security concern as more and more uh, critical data goes online. Okay, Aggie, thanks very much for that reporting. Bloomberg's Agatha Cantrill reporting on um, the big push against big tech. Uh, mentioning the Munich Security Conference, which, by the way, was my first big gig with, with Agatha uh, when she started for Bloomberg. A great conference um, to go to and a lot going on uh, down there. We interviewed Miles Davis, actually, at that conference. Not the musician, obviously, Tom. I was about to say, I had, I had the musician. That would, have been, that, that, that would have been particularly cool, man. Back, back, I was, back I was, in the grave. Back, yeah. So back, talk from one conference to another, I was at the Mobile World Congress this week. It's the biggest mobile and telecoms event. They were talking about cybersecurity, and a big push is around satellite communication networks. So the Europeans trying to emulate, wanting to emulate what Musk has done with Starlink, precisely because they think it will be more secure. Yeah, I imagine that every region, um, especially those that aren't allied, need to develop their own competencies in all of these tech areas. You know, that's why um, a lot of people are so worried when we report on crypto that the U.S. is mm -hmm. so far behind China. They've already got their own CBDC rolled out and we're still struggling with regulation. And it's part of the rationale. It's part of Chinese policymakers' rationale for reining in the tech sector is concerns about data security. You can think of DD as an example. When I was in China, I remember hearing officials saying, we're concerned that data is going to be accessible to the security services uh, in the U.S. So it all ties in, doesn't it, Matt? It, it's, yeah, it's an ongoing conversation. We're going to continue to be yeah. talking about this for sure. That's it for early edition. But the OG surveillance is ahead with Lisa John and Tom will hear from Dan Ives of Wedbush, among others, after Tesla. This is Bloomberg.